Hello and welcome to the Linux Spotlight. This show is dedicated to showing off the best thing about Linux, our community. This community is made up of developers, distro maintainers, YouTubers, and everyday users. Each one plays a vital role in our community. And the goal is to have a discussion with each individual about their journey into Linux and beyond. So join me now as we turn the spotlight on. I'm your host, Rocco, and with me today, our special guest is none other than Chris Fisher. Hello, Rocco. I'm special. You Thank are you. special, dude. <laughs> <laughs> you are special because you're a guest on the show. It does feel special. I feel honored. Thank you for having me. I've been watching the show. I've noticed a few of my friends have been on recently, so it caught my attention. I think it's great. You hustle for this show. I well, can tell. We, we try to highlight everybody in the community, whether it be, every, you know, just a normal user or people like yourself that are all over the place. Mm. <laughs> so <laughs> most people, Chris, will know you for, you know, being a podcaster, a content creator, a uh, producer of uh, so much content that you, that one man can't view or listen to all of it. I challenge that. No, I, I, <laughs> it is a lot though. <laughs> I mean, you've been creating <clears throat> stuff for over 13 years at JB. True. And yeah. it is the most popular Linux content outlet out there. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I just, uh, I think I'm crossing my almost eight years full-time doing it now too, which that blows, I just can't even comprehend that. That is awesome, dude. But Chris, that is what everybody knows you for. But if you were to meet somebody that didn't know who you were and they were to ask you, who is Chris Fisher personally? What would you say? I think probably most, most dads with kids my age probably answer a father first, I think. Cause you know, that's a big part of your world is, and I have three kids, so that's pretty big. Um, and geek like falls pretty close in there, you know, because that's, <laughs> but then like, I gotta, I gotta like, wait, should I mention husband or like, you know, where does that fit in? So it's a complicated answer. Depends on my audience. Well, okay. So let's just dive in a little bit deeper. Uh -huh. Sure. So you're the, obviously the head of Jupiter Broadcasting, which has, um, tons of shows to watch. Yeah. What is your typical day in the life of Chris Fisher? <laughs> well, it's mostly, um, we do, we do so much, as you know, we were just kind of chatting on the pre-show about how much work goes into an episode. There's so much work. Um, and when you do have as many shows as we do, it's, uh, it's, it is a lot of work. So we spend a considerable amount of time behind the scenes. Um, we have, we have full-time people now that do research. We've really tried to do a lot of fact checking, um, so much so that it's a big part of our, big part of our time now. But then on top of that, I've really recently got into home automation and home assistant and all of that stuff. So I, every, like yesterday I had the day off, I was working on my camera system. I have a really cool camera system now. And uh, so I, I find that I, I really kind of geek out on topics for a while. Um, I think they're all over the place as I've gotten older, the, the, the kind of things I'll geek out on has gotten wilder and wider. But yep. I love it. Yep. Um, so this is all has related, related to tech or, you know, Linux in general. What, what other hobbies do you have outside of Linux? <laughs> it's all geeky stuff. I'm a big <laughs> geek. Um, <clears throat> mostly these days it's, it's just spending time with the kids and with the wife because she has a pretty busy work schedule and I have a pretty busy work schedule. So we have tried to set time aside to do things. We recently kind of went on a little mini road trip. A lot of our downtime and hobbies uh, involve our RV. Uh, for almost five years, I've lived full time in an RV of some form. They just fit me really well. I just happen to like it. I like to move around and I enjoy the challenge of building a mobile production studio with solid internet and all that stuff that comes with it. I find it sort of like brings a new edge to what I do. Um, so 
went on a little mini road trip, just a day trip, do a lot of that, work on the RV and spend time with the kids. It's really kind of that or work. Work is a six day a week kind of thing. So it's yep. a lot of that. Yeah. Well, especially with the amount of stuff you're doing, uh, you're into like everything, but I have seen your, your vlogs. Um, oh yeah. It's YouTube. been a while, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and the mm. cool thing about this is it gives you that, you know, insight into your life personally and everybody always likes to, uh, see that. Um, yeah. but you, like you said, you spend a lot of time in the RV and you do all kinds of like drone footage and stuff. Uh huh. Uh huh. So I do love the drone. Give me like a favorite place to visit that combines those. Okay, Rocco. Well, <laughs> the Pacific Northwest. Have you been? Have you been? No, I have not. Okay. Well, if you ever get an opportunity to come out to like a Linux Fest, it's really kind of just coming to life in April, which is when Linux Fest Northwest is. And it's truly one of the most beautiful places in the world. Uh, we have like a couple of highlights we take people to. Mount Rainier is incredible. Um, as well as a place called Deception Pass, which looks like it's from the Lord of the Rings. You go across this bridge that's between cliffs with the ocean on either end of it, and it's, it's magical. Um, and as far as just incredible camping, the Pacific Northwest, including Oregon and Idaho, has so much good free camping. A lot of it was cell signal even. Um, that there's Rocco, Rocco, it could be a whole show. It could be a whole show. It really could. I, it's been like, I thought about it and be like, no, nobody'd watch that, but I really could do a whole thing on it. People would watch it, dude. Trust me. I yeah. do love this area. And you know, I've, um, I've, I've, I've traveled a bit and I have to admit there is plenty of other beautiful places in the world, but that Pacific coast, especially in the Oregon area is really something special. So there's a little town specifically. I'll give you one of my secret spots. There's uh -oh. a little town called Port Orford, and you can camp in your vehicle overnight for free right on the coast. And it's got these huge rocks and all of these waves, and it's beautiful sandy beaches um, for totally free. And it's a little kind of eclectic town. Not great, but just a little bit of a gem, and not many people know about it. I'm writing it down now. Port Orford. Now I've wrecked it, but you've ruined it. But uh, <laughs> nobody will know. It's just me and you. Yeah, that's all, okay. the only people that don't know. <laughs> so, um, you know, having JB means you are around people that hear about Linux all the time, that know about Linux, that don't look at you like you're crazy when you talk mm -hmm. about Linux. Um, but what about uh, other places in your life, personal contacts, maybe friends, family? Do they, are they receptive to Linux? Do they give you that look? Boy, has this changed. Um, I, I think when I first started doing podcasting 13 years ago, it was rare to hear people talk about a website or Amazon, like at a, at like a restaurant. And now, like you hear people mentioning apps and iPhones and Amazon and Prime and Netflix, like it's just part of the common vernacular. Um, and so a lot of my family, because I've been doing it for a while now, has grokked through conversations over the years that Linux powers like all that. And what I do covers like the core of all of that. And so that's how I explain it to them is Linux is like the thing behind Amazon. It's the thing behind Netflix. It's what's enabling all of this stuff that you use. That app you launch on your iPhone's connecting to a Linux server. And I kind of take that approach with them and that's right. clicked, but it has been a long journey and I'm not convinced that all of them still get it, but I have gotten better and better reception and I've noticed they'll start asking questions. Like they proactively start the conversation now. I don't initiate the conversation about it. And that seems like a sign that it's sticking. That's definitely an improvement because I don't get anybody to initiate a conversation <laughs> about computers. Right well, I, I've had this weird job for a really long time. And so every aunt and uncle has been trying like, so what do you do again? Uh, you, it's like radio, you know, like they just like they're, but now, now that, now that podcasting is a thing, um, like the, it clicks, like they get what podcasting is and they get what cloud services are. So I have something I can relate both aspects of the job to and that's helped a lot, but I years struggled with that. I would avoid that conversation, which is like, a, like the number one thing when you meet somebody, it's like, Hey, my name's so-and-so. So what do you do for a living? So what do you do for a living? 
that is such a loaded question because they're trying to they're trying to understand like where you kind of stack up in the social order perhaps you make more than they do perhaps they make less and you're it's like a sizing question and if you don't have a great answer if you say oh i podcast for a living it sounds it's worse than saying you're like a blogger it sounds bad it, it did for a long time um and so i like had this like weird awkward conversation that i would try to avoid and now i can just say oh yeah podcast Yep. Can you believe it? I get paid to podcast. Oh, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> and every and nobody looks at you like you're crazy. Not, not as much, at least. There's other reasons they might, but not for that. <laughs> well, we're going to get into JB okay. and all of that. But let's start at the beginning. When you started in computers, what was the first computer you touched? Oh, boy. I think it was... I mean, I, I want to say... My poor recollection is that it was a trash 80, but I'm I, back in the day, early day, my, my grandma was a garage sale connoisseur. And so I'd go visit her on the weekend and she and I would go garage sale shopping and I would pick up, and this is probably mid eighties at this point, I would pick up used old computers. And like, these are the ones where you know, like coaxial connections to connect them into your television and the big old cartridges. And yeah, those are my first computers. Um, and then um, I pretty early on got into the Macintosh because my mom got into graphic arts. And so she had a Macintosh and she got a used Macintosh. And at the same time, my dad and my best friend had gotten PCs that ran DOS. So I had kind of like this sort of really early on, the sort of broad exposure probably primarily Macintosh early on. Yeah. Well, Apple II mean, that... actually, actually now I think about it, it was Apple II before the Macintosh. Wow. <laughs> oh my gosh. <sighs> <laughs> Bad memories or what? <laughs> it's just, you know, when you talk about this stuff, you realize how long ago that was. Yep. Well, you do, you have uh, when you're getting into that kind of experience, I've talked to a lot of people and they go back a long ways, but uh, they don't all have that broad experience of all the systems Oof. put together. Just going to have a mini panic attack real quick about it, and then I'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> Just a really long time. <laughs> so in this, all of these computers, where do you first hear about Linux? So that is a surprising source. Um, so you got to keep in mind I'm in the Seattle area, which is right next door to Redmond, which is where Microsoft HQ is. So a lot of friends and family growing up over the years had some connection or perhaps full employment at Microsoft. And one of them was a cousin of mine. His name's Bill. And um, he was my geeky cousin. I, I didn't even appreciate it at the time how, how cool he was, but he was a really cool dude. And one like family get together, it could have been a Thanksgiving, it could have been a wedding party. I don't know. We're all over at his new beautiful house because he's got great Microsoft money. And he brings me down to his home office. And in there, he's got a paper bag full of stuff he's brought home from Microsoft. Back then, they had this policy where if it was under $1,000 and it was of a certain age, you could just check it out of inventory and take it home. And they didn't ask for it back. And they just thought that that was a way for employees to learn. Um, so he brought home some CDs for me, a CD-ROM reader, and this white trifold or quadfold thing of Red Hat 5.1 maybe. And he said, this is something we've been experimenting with at Microsoft and we're really impressed. I think you should learn this. St install this on one of your rigs. This is really early Red Hat. And, and I didn't really take him seriously, but I was like, oh, okay, well, I'll give it a go. And one, one like weekend, I was really bored and I installed it and I thought, okay, this is pretty neat. This is great. This is pretty, I'll go, I'll go talk to my geeky friends at school who we were all taking Windows NT4 training to become certified Microsoft NT technicians. And we had a couple of computers in our Windows NT lab that we had put Linux on. And I brought in a disk and they had brought in some disks and we had a Debian machine and we had a Red Hat machine. And I was showing them this Red Hat and so on. I'm like, see, this is, this, is a, this is the desktop and here's the icons and here's a toolbar and here's a command. Look, you can delete stuff with this. This is so long ago, or, or they trolled me, I can't recall exactly. I, in my showing off of how cool Linux was, deleted my root partition. Oh, wow. Oh, yep. yeah, that's good. <laughs> and it took me about a minute to realize what had happened because I started getting weird error messages. But for that whole minute, 
I kept using the computer. I, I had, I think it was Star Office at the time I had that open. I had a terminal open. I had some crazy old browser going and they all kept running. And I just deleted the whole file system. And I, it was that moment I had, I had this realization. This is so much cooler than Windows. Windows would never let me do this. <laughs> no, no. Oh my gosh. Well, you wouldn't. Yeah. No, that wouldn't happen in Windows. <laughs> no, no. And then fast forward, you know, a year or so. Um, again, because I'm old, we were deploying 802.11b, which at the time was only two megabits. We did eventually get a firmware update that uh, took us up to 11. And we set up point-to-point -point access points between all of our buildings. And it flattened the district network. So print jobs were going all over the network, causing quite, a, quite an issue. And we put a Linux box in as a proxy router. And we did a Debian install this time. And when I started using apt, it was apt-get, and I... I experienced Debian and, and how it could automatically resolve package dependencies where Red Hat did not. Uh, that's when it clicked. And that's when we started switching over our NetWare servers, our Windows boxes. We went, we went all in. And I kind of never looked back. I, 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 what I did is I became sort of the person you went to if you want to integrate Windows and Linux and NetWare, which was a huge thing back then. And it became, a, it became my, my shtick to get work. So did you, were, did you still stick with Windows at all? Or you just went right to Linux or what? Mm, you know, I, at that time, I kind of had my foot in both camps. Um, and there was this hot new product coming out called NT5, which was replacing NT4 that we were beta testing for Microsoft. And it was in this transition into Windows 2000. And then they decided to rename it Windows 2000. It was right around this time. And they came to us and they said, we'd like you to take this and we'd like you to replace the Linux proxy and the Linux router with this Windows machine running this Microsoft proxy software. And we said, you know what? Actually, that was what we tried first before we tried the Linux box. Because our, as students, we were getting certifications on Active Directory, which was still in development, it was crazy. So we, we went Windows first because that's what we were going for for jobs. Right. And again, it's the Seattle area. Um, and it just sucked. <laughs> it was really bad. So we had to put a Linux box in there. So when we refused, they really played hardball with us. And they pulled a ton of our licenses. They pulled our vouchers for certifications. And they oh, took wow. it all the way to the board. And so it left a real bad taste in my mouth. So after Windows 2000, I kind of stopped using Windows, except for on the server. I, I did use Windows on the server for a bit longer for clients, but um, that was more like um, in terminal server cases or SQL server connecting back to like a Linux system for storage, stuff like that. That was a big thing for a long time. But that whole experience with Microsoft where they got so petty about that one proxy server at, at one high school in you know a, a school district that was 40 miles north of seattle it, it just seems seemed seemed evil actually right. and it, it kind of it kind of created this anti microsoft campaign that i went on for a very long time i i really was i really felt like microsoft was the source of all evil and uh hated them for a long time because of that wow. There's a lot, you, you know, you're not, your experience is not alone. I mean, there's a lot of people that uh, had real world experiences of why they hated Microsoft. Mm -hmm. um, do you still use Windows or Mac in any way? I haven't used Windows since they announced the Windows subsystem for Linux WSL 2. So I installed Windows 10 and went through all of the hoops you had to go back then to actually get it up to current to then install WSL 2. Um, and, and played around with a VM pass through on my Linux box. But outside of that, no, uh, I have a Mac that I have in the studio that I will do every now and then like a, a soundboard project on or something like that. Cause it's got this app to join files together, but otherwise, no, uh, there's no, like up here in my, we're up here in my office. This is my office above the studio. No more Macs, um, no more Macs in editing, no more Macs in recording, no more Macs. Uh, but I have, uh, behind me a, um, like a 2013 MacBook Pro that is running an Antigross install from 2016. And I just brought it up to date after a year of no updates, like last week. And then I got a MacBook in the studio, like I said, that I used to build soundboard like jingles. Because, you know, I've got them and they're perfectly fine machines. Like, in fact, I'm impressed by 
how decent they remain. Um, yep. I'd love to, I'd love to be able to buy a current MacBook Pro and get a great Linux experience on it. It's just not, not going to happen. Did you have any issues with uh, that Intergos update? Like you hadn't updated for a yeah. year? Oh, yeah. Oh, I had to work <laughs> through some things, yeah. But, you know, I, it's funny, Rocco, because I said to myself, I said, Chris, if this thing updates and you manage to reboot and the thing boots, I think you should give Arch another go. And so I spent an entire day just sort of like as I was doing other things, I'd like look over my head at right because I'm buried in laptops right now. And so I had it right here and I was just checking in on it and I would maybe Google something and I'd spend like 30 seconds every 15 minutes on it. Doing that throughout the entire day, it eventually finished and, and then it rebooted even using the MacBook kernel from the AUR and it worked. And when that worked, I sat down my thumb disk with KDE Neon and I plugged in my thumb disk with Manjaro and I installed Manjaro on this workstation we're talking on right now because I was so damn impressed. I just, I was just blown away. <laughs> well, you mentioned that and you also mentioned, you know, you're, you've distro hopped a billion times. Okay. Yeah. I try uh, not to, but it just but, comes up. It happens. <laughs> well, that was my question to you. Um, just this past episode of, uh, Linux Unplugged, you talked about changing your machine over. So what is it that is appealing to you that you just, like, I am in the same boat. And I ask myself this question, and I don't always get the answer from myself, but what is it that appeals to people that... It's changed for me. Um, years ago, it was something doesn't work. I don't want to fix it. I'll move to the distro that already has this solved. That's a big reason I've jumped around to Mandrake back in the day and, and all of that kind of stuff. And so when I started doing it again, just recently, I thought, oh, I must be in that mode again. But then I thought a bit more about it and I realized it's that we have really, really good choices and they each do something different, a little bit better. Like, uh, right now, I'm just really enjoying Plasma again after spending quite a bit on Gnome Shell, but quite a bit of time. And before Gnome Shell, I was on XFCE and they're all good now. <laughs> They're all good. And, and so I, I, I jump over and I'm like, okay, this is pretty great. So now you say to yourself, well, then why not just swap desktops on one distro? That would be much, much simpler. The thing is, is not all Plasma desktops are the same. Right. I think the defaults that get tweaked matter a lot. And Manjaro does a really good job. They do a really good job just out of the box. It's a really solid Plasma setup with things that I would have changed uh, fonts that I would have had to install, the right apps. Um, for comparison, I installed the Plasma meta package on, on a base Fedora install, and it's junk. I love Fedora, but the Plasma experience, if I thought that's what Plasma was like, I wouldn't use it. Yep. Yeah, you're right. There, there are good Plasma implementations, and there are some that are just, well, there are some that are just plain vanilla, like KD yeah. Neon is just plain vanilla. And, and that's true are, for Gnome Shell, too. Yep. Yeah. And then I just, I think Arch is just a great distro in general. It really is pretty solid. I haven't used it for quite a while. I went really all in on the LTS distros and then I went all in on Fedora for, our, I, <laughs> I, what I do now is I hop for like nine months at a time and then I hop again. So I don't do it as frequently anymore. <laughs> well, I think on this machine, I've been on Pop! OS since mm, April. I think yeah, it was Pop! April OS that is good. So I, I, I thought that that was a bad call on their part. And I think it was a great call. I take that all that criticism back. They've really, they've done something different with it. They've differentiated in a way that I think stands out that people have been drawn to. And the real like kind of sinker for me was when I tried it on system 76 hardware and then it mm -hmm. clicked, it really clicked for me. It's a good, it's a good distro, even if you're not on their hardware, but on their hardware, they can just tweak a few things and solve a few problems. That's just Ah, love it. So do you have a go-to Linux distro that you, like if I have, if you have to have a machine that's up and running and stable, do you have a go-to one? Well, so far it's been Kubuntu uh, 18.04. Um, that's what we run in the studio. Uh, the LTSs are just really solid and that is also an LTS of Plasma. So it's, it's a really nice stack. So I, I, all the hopping I've done on my laptop and on this workstation that's aside, the studio remains and will remain on Kubuntu. Uh, I just think it's a really solid distribution. I also 
have one machine just for testing purposes in the studio on neon. And that's also been really good. It's been really solid. So that's kind of my go-to. And then right now for my personal machine, it'd probably be Manjaro. And then on the server, I'd be really debating between CentOS 8 and Ubuntu 18.04. I've, it's really job specific, Rocco. It's a mess. It's a mess. In a few months, them choices might change. <laughs> yeah. I'm, yeah. Like 2004 is definitely going to be on the list for sure. Yeah. Looking forward to that. I think that's going to be a really good release. I think Canonical is really firing in all cylinders and having Martin Wimpress leading the desktop charge now. I think it's really going to be next level. Yep. Well, good let's times. get into uh, JB a little bit. Okay. And I, you know, correct me if I get any of this info wrong. I'm just going on by some memory and some digging. So, well, my memory is horrible. So between the two of us, I'm sure we'll get a few corrections. <laughs> so in around 2006, you created Jupyter Broadcasting. Okay. Um, you had started with um, Brian Lunduke and a show called The Linux Action Show. Yeah. And we also had a show called Cast a Blaster back then too. Yeah. yeah. Well, I don't. Okay, so I remember watching the Linux Action Show. I don't remember watching that show, and I don't. It wasn't know as why. popular. Yeah, it wasn't very popular. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> it was well, not very popular. No. Be, you know, like how do you go from being a Linux user to wanting to start a podcast? Um, I have a bit of a built-in, gotta, gotta preach the good word when I get really passionate about something. Um, people have often said I'm sort of a, a salesman about things, but I really am just an advocate when I find something I really like. And when we started Linux Action Show, the conversation was the stuff I'm doing at work is blowing my mind. And I was like really enjoying saving the company a lot of money and solving big problems using free software. It was like, I gotta share the word. And that rolled into an, I needed an outlet. We needed some place to talk about it. We already had Castablasta. Brian and I already had a good working uh, on, on air rapport. And we had a good, we had a good thing going with our buddy, John and Castablasta. We already had all the equipment and all the connections. So it just seemed natural. Well, Brian likes Linux. I like Linux. Let's talk about Linux too. And um, that's, the seed that I still go by. Like I, I still love this stuff so much that I, I got to talk about it somewhere. I think I'd be, I'd be going to every single lug meeting in, in my neighborhood if I wasn't doing these shows. And I wonder if I, I, I probably will always be talking about this in some form or another, unless I just go full hermit up in a mountain somewhere. <laughs> Take the RV and go. <laughs> oh man, it's possible. It could happen. <laughs> <laughs> he dreams. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah. Well, I looked on the uh, Jupiter Broadcasting YouTube channel, mm. and all of the episodes of shows are on there, but I'm, I kind of switched it around and went back to the oldest I sure. could find on yeah. there. Yeah. And I think the oldest was a bloopers, like 10 minute really? video of you. It wasn't bloopers, but it was a, a video of you and Brian uh, introducing a, an Amazon. Uh, oh yeah, that was like that was the announcement of the Kindle. Yes, yes. Oh my gosh! And you you were talking about it, and you were saying how well we're not in, we're not reviewing this because it's this, and we're not reviewing it because it runs Linux. And then Brian <laughs> yes. loses his mind and says, "It does run Linux. <laughs> it does yeah. run Linux." Yes, yes. <laughs> wow, I can't believe I remember that. And that was we were busting up about that. And you know that seems. Like the Kindle seems like it has been around for a million years. Yep. Well, through the whole rest of the video, he's highlighting your mistake. Um, and it was hilarious to watch. Okay. So is that like the chemistry that you had in the Linux action show? Is that what made it so popular? I think that was a big part of it. I think too, it was a chance to showcase stuff that um, not a lot of other people at the time were talking about, but also, not a lot of other people could grok visually. You know, I always kind of looked at it as sort of a showcase show of the best of the best that's out there for the most part. Uh, not every episode, of course. And, um, but a big part of that, I think, was uh, we had a good dynamic in the conversation. We could play like uh, either role. And so if he wanted to go right, I could go left or vice versa. Um, I think a great example of that, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but... Um, we did the Windows Action Show one time, 
And no, no, I don't remember seeing that. It's, I think, very funny. It was an April Fool's episode that we did. And we do an early look at Windows 10. And the premise is we're Windows guys doing a Windows podcast. And at this point in time, the Windows 10 beta was a disaster dumpster fire bad. It was like you couldn't even launch solitaire bad. And so the premise is a couple of Windows guys have to rationalize why this thing's so awful. And we, that was as much pre-discussion as we had. And the rest of the episode was improv. Everything in the episode was improv. And it, I think it worked really well. Um, you know, that's, I love an opportunity to work with. Anytime I can work with a co-host where we can kind of do that, um, I think it's, it's, it's really kind of a unique opportunity. It's like you get in sync with a person and it really, it really works. Like I have to, I, I also would, I would recommend checking out episode 100 of Linux Unplugged, which is when Wes Payne joined right on episode 100. And he comes out of the other room from a barbecue. He sits down on a microphone and he and I are immediately shucking and jiving. Like we've been doing it for five years and it's to this day. It's like, I, when I listen back, I'm like, man, Wes is right on point. Like he's, he's following right along. He's got something to say. He's quick with it. You know, it's uh, so it's, again, it's like that same kind of thing. When I get an opportunity to work with somebody like that, I, I think it's probably one of my favorite things to do. Yeah. It's, there are people that you can talk to. There are people you can do podcasts with, but when you have somebody that you connect with, and that you can go together and do things. That is something that people want to see and people want to watch. That comes through. Yeah, yeah. It is a lot of fun, too. It's just more fun. It is fun, too. <laughs> but that's a side product, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, when you're doing it every week, that helps, yeah. right? You know, because there's, there's weeks that aren't great weeks. Well, you know, with the success of uh, the Linux Action Show, um, now, you created Jupiter Broadcasting. Now, I had mentioned earlier you created it in 2006, but you created the Linux Action Show in 2006. You didn't create Jupiter Broadcasting until 2008, right? Oh, uh, okay. Okay. All right. That sounds... We did create... I don't know the date specifically, but we did create last... Uh, it feels like a few years, maybe a couple years before we made JB. We, JB kind of came along when we had like three or four podcasts we wanted to do. And we're like, well, we should probably just have one website and, you know, distribute it there. Right. Well, there's my first mistake. So you can count that check one for one mistake. Um, but, you know, how do you like you go from a podcast or one or two to saying, hey, I want to go and do a whole network of podcasts. I mean, how do you how do you go about that? You turn 30 and realize I don't want to do IT for the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> really? Okay. Yeah, I was it. I was like, I turned 30 and I'm like, you know, I kind of, I kind of gotten up high in the IT support tier. So like my clients were all the really important clients that had like million dollar contracts every 15 minutes that were on the line. And so it was both like cancer hospitals and lawyers, those and, oh, and, and airline, and I had an airline client too. So, I mean, it was, and those were just three out of like a dozen clients and it was really stressful because it's all your fault, right? And I really took it on myself to do a good job, so I really would not do well when they were unhappy. Um, and so I think after doing that for a while, I came to a point where I realized I was pretty miserable. Um, and I had this, this transition of thought that changed my whole perspective. When I realized that I could treat advertisers as clients. Like I had built up this client business where I maintained relationships, sent them reports, invoice them, call them, see if they need anything, keep a dialogue going. These are all things that are, well, mandatory if you want a healthy sponsor relationship. And when I just was sitting at my desk one day and when I had that click of thinking, I realized, well, hell, I know how to do that. I mean, I can, I can do that all day long. That's what I do for my day job. I, I really am. I'm managing clients is what I do. And the IT work is, is the work that they need, but keeping that relationship is a huge part of the job. And then I realized, well, I have like a, a great co-host now in Jude. He's super knowledgeable. We could start the TechSnap podcast. Uh, and we, it's a pretty easy explanation. TechSnap, Systems Network Administration Podcast. That's a, pretty, that's a pretty easy pitch to advertisers. We're making a podcast for sysadmins. 
this is a long time ago. There's not a lot of podcasts for sysadmins. So that's an easy story I can make. I can tell the, I can tell the sponsor that I can, I can sell some advertising spots and Alan can talk for days and he knows up and down, you know, networking and servers. And I realized that that's my recipe. Find somebody compelling, something that we can genuinely share insights on because I had been doing that. I had been doing system administration work for nearly 10 years by that point. I started when I was still in junior, uh, when I was still a junior in high school, I became the district, one of the district network admins. Uh, so I really thought, this is great. I'll, I'll just be able to use that experience. Alan will be able to use his experience. And we created a great little show that made the advertisers happy. And then kind of from there, I thought, okay, well, what else can we play with? And we tried different stuff. You know, we tried gaming quite a bit, tried a lot of gaming for a bit. Really wanted to do gaming because how fun would it be to get paid right. to play video? Right, right. <laughs> That's an old brainer, really. Gave it a good go. Um, I will say built a lot of really good community connections through those shows. People that I'm still in contact with that still follow our shows. Um, I mean, like, I've had some of those audience members over to my home. <laughs> like, it's really like deep connections. So it was worth it, but it wasn't, um, it wasn't going to be sustainable. And so I kind of had to like keep tweaking the recipe until I figured out, okay, what, what do I still enjoy that can also make an income doing so I can actually keep doing this because I can't just keep doing a bunch of these shows for free because it takes time editing, all that hosting, all that kind of stuff. Right. Well, you being in it, um, and then still having podcasts to do, you spend probably all of your free time doing that. Hmm. Yeah, I burned a lot of late hours, uh, which is kind of good and bad. Um, before I had an editor, I would be easily up till 3 a.m. editing and publishing. And there was a period of time where my, my son, my firstborn, was, was having stomach issues and was very uncomfortable at night. So I would just stay up and swaddle him and edit. And so there was, it was kind of good to be up. I didn't, that wasn't a long period. But when that kind of ended, I, I pretty, pretty soon realized I can't keep doing this. Like I, I got to hire an editor. And um, that was a really crazy time because not only did we want to bring an editor on, but we wanted to convert the studio into a full-time production house because we needed something that was turnkey, go in and start producing. Because if you're making eight to 11 shows a week, fighting the tech stack every single time is, is a real time consumer. Yep. Well, going back to your IT days, do you have any like uh, horror stories of... Um things that happened that you needed to pull your hair out. <laughs> okay. I might have a story. I don't know if I've ever told on, I may have maybe once told it somewhere on air, but I didn't want to say anything for a really long time. Cause I didn't want to get in trouble, but now the company doesn't even exist anymore. So I think it's safe. Okay. So I was an IT, I was an IT employee at a financial institution and eventually they outsourced all of IT. I didn't know this was coming at the time until one night. It's about 4 p.m., 5 p.m., and we're doing an upgrade. And we had told the whole staff for like two weeks, we're taking our exchange server down. We're going from Exchange 5.5 to Exchange 2000. It's a big deal. And of course, I'm, on, I'm, I'm part of the network team. I'm part of the server team, so I'm there. I'm there, even though I'm not doing the exchange upgrade. I'm there. And about six o'clock comes around and the cleaning staff goes into the server room. And this, I can't even believe it, but this is not actually the first time this happened. This is like the second time this happened. The cleaning individual, whoever they were, I can't remember, unplugged a surge protector to plug in the vacuum. And in doing so, because we had bad, bad practices back then, they unplugged our exchange server during an upgrade to Exchange 2000. That destroyed the system. Like oh we had to go my. full recovery mode. Then all of a sudden I was working because guess what? The backup server was on backup PC running Linux. So guess, guess who has to start <laughs> doing a data restore? <clears throat> Better make sure Chris's backups are working. So we get it restored after hours. This is like 11 p.m. midnight. It took a really long time to get this thing back up and going because we had to reload the OS and when we had to reload Exchange and then we wanted to still go to Exchange 2000. So it was just awful. And I needed to concentrate. So I went into the only area in IT that was closed off. It was the uh, chief technology officer, the CTO's office. So I go in there and I close the door, bring my laptop in so I can focus. But my laptop, because I'm fancy, is like Xandros or something. It's not actually Windows. So I wake up his machine because I want to actually use a Windows box running Outlook to properly test this Exchange server. 
and I wake up his machine and his outlook's already up because that's what they lived out of and in start coming emails and I'm like, oh, good, good. And in there is the subject line, rethoughts on outsourcing IT department. And it's the oh. first email that's highlighted right there. And there's the email about their plan over the next three months to outsource the entire IT department. And oh. I'm sitting there and a buddy of mine walks in to say, hey, is it working? Why aren't you saying anything? And all I can do is just, be, I just like pointed at the screen because he was in IT too. And I'm just like, well, now what do we do? And we didn't say anything to anybody else, but like we had knew at that point and right. we knew this thing was coming. And so like, that was a heck of an experience in the, in the industry. I have to say that was really something. Oh man. That's like a, that's like a gut punch, dude. It was, it was. And here we are like at midnight, practically like, you know, uh, sacrificing our health and our youth to get this thing back up and running. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the first email I see. <laughs> oh my gosh. But the backup was successful, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it sure was. And we did get it. We did get it upgraded to exchange 2000. So that was good. <laughs> But man, I dreaded that. And um, I ended up actually, it ended up being a great thing for me. Turns out, you know, isn't that funny how these things work? Yep. Um, because uh, I had gone over to the CEO's house on several occasions to help with his home computer system. Just like the good old days when I used to get called out of school to go fix the teacher's systems. I get called out of class. I got, I get called over to the CEO's house, one of his many houses to fix his computer system. And so I was, I guess on his favorite list. So he had them open a new position in security for penetration testing and put me in there. And I learned up on the job how to do security auditing and pen testing and enjoyed the heck out of it and was able to then parlay that into my contracting work down the road. Right. So it turned out good, but it was a heck of a night. It turned out good. But you, like, like we talked about, you decided you wanted to get out of IT, go to JB. Mm -hmm. you know, do this for a living. Okay. So it was the goal to make a successful living with JB, but did yeah, you ever think it was, business. yeah. Did you ever think it was going to get as big as it did or is, I should uh, say? No. Um, because I, I thought it would just be me and an editor for a long time. And then, you know, a few co-hosts, but I didn't expect, I guess, I mean, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't really know where podcasting was going to go, but I felt like it had potential. And so as, as podcasting has grown and Linux has grown and interest in Linux has grown, we've been in a really good spot because more people are discovering podcasting and more people are discovering Linux. And so that's been wonderful for us. And then when I started thinking about it more from how do I make sure that what we're creating is something A, I can be proud of and B, it genuinely gives back. Like as a, as somebody who gobshites, how can I give back? And then I, it really kind of came to an appreciation that how we talk about things, how knowledgeable we are about what we talk about and how we kind of reach out to projects for comment matters. And it makes our coverage add something to the overall discussion that is original and I think important. And so when I realized that was the direction I wanted to go, I had to scale up a team a little bit. You know, I, I needed something that would be sustainable because um, as it turned out, I had quite an experience coming up in the hospital. I was going to be out for a while. I was out for a month. I didn't, you know, in the old model where it was just going to be me and editor and a few hosts, the network would have gone silent for a month and probably collapsed. Right. <laughs> I guess I wouldn't, I wouldn't have been running any ads either. And you know, when you're running a lifestyle business, you, you don't really have a lot of runway for that kind of stuff. And yep. also it's very hard to get health insurance in the U S. So I was like, I, I, I want to take this to another level. And I, I want people to be able to spend their full time on this. Like it's, it's important enough that it should be the only thing they have to work on. And yeah, that's when I decided, okay, we're going to grow it up a little bit. Although I'm pretty happy. I don't really feel like it needs to be any larger. It, um, I think it's a pretty solid operation. I think if we wanted to add more shows, we'd probably have to add a little more staff, but I think it's all pretty proportional now. Well, you had so much success uh, with Lass, and video was a big part of that, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. And I have heard over the years uh, many times in podcasts that, you know, like when I was with Destination Linux, uh, there were some people that said, hey, why, you, why don't you just do audio? And that would have been a whole lot simpler, but I think mm -hmm. 
I'm partial to video because mm -hmm. it connects with people. But what made you choose to drop the video portion of your content and go straight audio? This is still something I think about a lot. Um, so there's like several ways I look at this. Um, it's, it was something that had been niggling in the back of my mind for years is that, you know, hey, man, you're putting like 90% of your effort into the video. Because if we're talking about a distro, then I needed to capture a screen and I needed to showcase that distro. And I had to have transitions and edits and remote video for our host, which there wasn't even Zoom back then. So it made it significantly more complicated, but it got a little bit better towards the end. Um, and, you know, we'll get, to, uh, we'll get a few thousand downloads on the video, which is great. And it was really maybe four or 5,000 downloads. And that was really encouraging. But in terms of last, you know, we'd get maybe 112,000 downloads on the audio. And so it was like I was punishing, not punishing, but I was underserving such a huge portion of the audience. Because when you're video, like you can't help but make references to things and, and, and things like that, especially when you're looking at the web page on the screen, like we did. Uh, it just didn't translate very well. But additionally, we couldn't do things like individual track recording. So everyone, even remote people, have local sounding audio. That kind of stuff was really niggling at me. Like I knew we could do better. I knew the audience was larger on the audio side. And I knew that the podcast audio medium was growing because of things like Apple podcasts and Spotify podcasts. Like it was just, it was blowing up and YouTube was becoming more of a restrictive platform. It was having more and more policy changes that I didn't approve of. It was harder and harder to earn revenue on the YouTube platform. There was more and more videos of a similar nature on the platform and that's growing exponentially. And I just looked at it and I thought, man, we can do a really, really good job at the audio. And we can kind of do a so-so job at the video. You know, like I could, I could do a little bit better, but like I'm kind of at my max capacity with what I can do with video. But with audio, we could really take it to the next level. And so that's when we invested in full-time audio editing and individual track recording and doing chapter markers and really trying to improve that experience. However, I do often think about kind of like going back and revisiting video, but making shows that are specifically for video. Because like one of the reasons I like to watch your show is it, it's right up on YouTube. I've got a YouTube app on my TV. Maybe I'm making dinner or something. And I'd like something that's about an hour long or so that's about Linux that I can just have while I'm cooking. Um, and so I, I myself seek out Linux video content quite frequently. So I know there must be other people doing the same. So I've thought about like every now and then firing up the old YouTube channel, uh, my personal one, and just doing like short, quick things on there. Like I mentioned, I have a whole bunch of laptops right now. I can right. be, you know. Um, so it crosses my mind. Uh, I just, I feel like I have a lot of conflicting priorities. And that editing and video time, because I, I really kind of am a perfectionist about it. It takes like, you know, six to seven hours of video. And I get, I get really weird about not using that time to spend with my kids if I have that time. Like, I really want to spend my energy there right now. Um, but I have imagined as they get older, which they already are, and uh, dad isn't as cool anymore, I'll probably have more free time on my hands. <laughs> it's already happening with the oldest, so. <laughs> and I might get back into it, to be honest. It's because it's, um, it pushes the creative edge, too, in a way, it, depending on how you approach it. Right. So, yeah. Yeah, but. It was great for discovery, uh, but now I think the audio medium is so strong. Like the people that listen to audio podcasts, the commuters, people that are doing chores, people that are on hikes, and 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 everybody that can just pop a, you know, something in their ear and listen or play it on their phone now because the speakers are so good. I don't think that's ever going away. I think that's always going to be an audience, and I, I think we're only getting started, really. So um, I see it as two different kinds of mediums and making content for each one individually. So that's why I experimented with the vlog a while back too. Is that was my go at this is content that's made for a video medium. Right. Well, I mean, I love both aspects of the audio and the video. Um, I, I love the audio aspect because, you know, like you said, I'm at work and I can pop in the AirPods and listen to, that's how I, that's how I consume the uh, Linux, you know, Linux Unplugged and all of the shows I listen to. Um, but I also have that, feeling that when you do video, you connect with people more or they mm -hmm. connect with you more. 
Mm-hmm. So I like both areas of it. But what, yeah. what, how did you adjust to going from video to audio? Because that's a big thing. I mean, yeah. like you said, you're referencing things that you see on the screen, but people can't see. Mm-hmm. So that was a lot of thinking and discussions and starting at one point and then through internal conversations, kind of whittling that idea into another point. Um, we have a, we have a philosophy of, of trying to kill a bad idea. Not that I, that's the wrong way to put it, but we have a philosophy of trying to look at it from all the angles and even with a critical eye to try to find something before the internet does to try to find what's wrong with it before YouTube comments do, which is impossible, but we look at it as it's better for us to be the first to find it than publicly find it. And so like an example of that is uh, our daily show, Linux headlines. Uh, It's reviewed by the researcher. It's reviewed by the editor. And then usually at least one host, sometimes two other hosts review the content and the full edited version before we hit publish, which we really, really strive for really solid accuracy in under three minutes. So it is an incredible amount of time ahead of time that goes into that to, to get there. And not that we couldn't do that with video, but a lot more of our time would be focused on the video elements. Even if it's just getting the tabs lined up and getting the pages so I can show them on screen and getting a frame set and making sure that the framing's right. And then got to make sure I record that. And then I need to bring that into my editor to process it a little bit, maybe make a few cuts, but can't do multi-track audio, but I can kind of compress what I did get. Um, And that's all time we now spend researching, contacting the projects and then fact checking. And I, I don't know, because I, I do follow what you're saying. Um, it, it, there was a connection there and it was a massive transition to make. It took, it was a painful process per show. And I think there wasn't, it wasn't a hundred percent positives, but I, I had to at a certain point go, you know, man, you've been doing this for a really long time and your instincts telling you this is what you got to do to, to make this thing sustainable. And I was fortunate enough that I think audio has gotten a lot more popular. And so we kind of made the switch at the right time. You know, Rocco, it really, it really came back to is I got a little bit older and I looked back at it and I said, I never asked myself if I should do video. I just, I knew I could do video. I had a webcam. I technically knew how to live stream. So I just, I just did it because I could do it. Why not do it? You know, I'm, I'm a cutting edge guy. Um, but then I never, I never said, well, does this make the art better? And I didn't, it wasn't until I was older and, uh, looking back at making changes and thinking, well, if I was going to do this right, like if I was really going to follow my heart on this and do what I think is right for the art, I think we got to make these changes. And man, it was a series of conversations. Let me tell you, it was really, it took a long time to get there. Cause I really was really attached to video. I really was. Yep. That's why we still publish waveform versions of all of our videos and keep all of our video feeds active and try to keep that going because just that medium does work better for some people. It does. And uh, it's good to be everywhere. Mm -hmm. That too. That's true. Yeah. So um, going back to the Linux Action Show one more time. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, After uh, Brian left in in 2012, so you continued hosting and you had hosts like uh, Matt Hartley Mm -hmm. and Alan Jude and Mm -hmm. finally Noah. Mm -hmm. Um, This show... Again, and I have to go back to, I think that part of this success of this show was the video portion because it was so cool to see people doing things with Linux. Yeah. You know, Um, but the last episode, now it was number 468 and that alone is amazing, dude. That's crazy. I I wish we could have gotten to 470 or even 500 possibly. That would have been. (laughs) But it was titled for the last time. Hmm. And I watched your vlog about it, about doing the last show. But hmm. how did, what did it feel like to do that last show? Hmm. God, I can't know if I really remember having a strong, because you're so, uh, when you're at a live event, you're so heads down on that, that I, I think the mis- looking back, one mistake we made was we didn't give it enough time to reflect and talk about it before we just did it. So we were so focused on the meetups and the the live portion of the show. Um, But we had a moment where we went afterwards, we went back to the studio and we recorded another little bit of it. And that was when we got a little more 
reflective and contemplative. And I think, I mean, I'm very proud of it, but I think also I was a bit relieved um, just because it took, uh, it took a lot of willpower to do it, number one. I was, and, and I wasn't sure what would happen after I ended it. Like, I wasn't sure if people would just go away, if, we, if, all, if the other shows wouldn't you know, pick up. I wasn't quite sure. Um, but I did have a kind of a sense that Linux Unplugged was getting pretty popular. Like the show that people were really talking about towards the end of LAS was Linux Unplugged. They weren't really talking about LAS anymore. Kind of LAS had kind of become standard steak and potatoes. It was, you know, it was every Sunday every, without fail and people just kind of got used to it. But yeah. Linux Unplugged was kind of new and dynamic and laid back and it wasn't as much of a presentation. It was more of a conversation. And so I, I, I had hoped that Linux Unplugged would pick up some of the slack and I kind of just took the plunge and I remember feeling very nervous about it. <laughs> very nervous. Um, and I wasn't, you know, I wasn't a hundred percent sure how the uh, ads would then perform for the sponsors. So I was very concerned that that could be an issue, although they were all very solid and um, that all worked out fine. And LUP, Linux Unplugged, it, it picked up the slack and now it's really my biggest show. Um, and in some ways, I think it's actually, for some of the things that I try to do now, it's surpassed LAS in a few ways. Um, this last episode, I'm really proud of it. We just put it out. It's called Flat Network Truthers. And we, we found a couple of different open source projects that are just, just really great. And it's just one of those things where we tracked down the authors of both of them and we emailed them. We're like, hey, we know it's last minute, but what do you think about coming on our show and just talking to us about your project? And so they both said yes within a matter of four minutes of each other. And we were able to get both interviews in the can and integrate it into the content and talk about the projects, how they functionally work, how they theoretically work, and then talk to the people behind them. And that's the kind of stuff I, I love to do now. And we, we hit that note a lot in Unplugged, but we also can just sort of, you know, like we're, gonna, we're thinking about for like the next one, just playing around with Cali and hacking stuff and seeing if Wes and I can hack each other's boxes. So there's like a whole <laughs> range it has. Um, so that's been really, that's been really nice. And I'm, I'm really thankful that, that that worked out because I was nervous about that. And I'd felt sort of, um, I felt sort of done with LAS. So I worked, I worked a hundred percent until the very end. And like I was able to end it when I was still willing to give a hundred percent, but I could tell I, something either had to shift. Like we had tried Fridays to see if that would, and it did make it easier, but it also kind of lost some of the live dynamic stuff and, just wasn't quite the same. Like having it every Sunday was like a, like a ritual and having it on Fridays didn't quite feel right. And so we moved it back, but I still needed something to give. And we tried audio for a little while there. We tried doing audio only, but that didn't work. So then we went back to video and nothing was really giving. And it was really kind of getting to the point where I'm like, I can see I'm going to start putting my, taking my foot off the gas here. Um, and so I think by ending last when I did, it allowed me to stay enthusiastic about all the other stuff we're doing. Whereas if I'd stuck with last just because it was really successful, I would have killed my motivation to do the shows. And I have this really horrible trait where if I'm not genuinely interested or motivated about something, I have a really hard time getting myself to do it. And um, I was worried about crossing that threshold. Right. Well, you got all kinds of shows now. Um, I got the list here of BSD now, uh, TechSnap, User Error, Linux Headlines, um, Linux Action News, Choose Linux, which is one of my favorites, uh, Self Hosted. Um, the you got the Extras feed. Uh, of course, uh, LUP is up to three hundred and thirty, I think, up to this recording it's catching here. Up. It's catching up to last. It's amazing. Um, and with the extras, you got um, even like mini shows in there, interviews. Uh, you have brunch with Brent in there, which. Mm -hmm. Uh, he did not pay me to say this, but I think he deserves his own feed. <laughs> there is a trick. If you if you go to his episode category, it does generate an RSS feed for uh, for shows tagged with brunch with Brent or something. There is a trick there. Oh, I agree. Nice. I could see us turning that into a show. Um, you know, it's nice to have extras though because it gives Brent an opportunity to explore this yes. without it having to be like a show that's got like all the focus of oh my gosh, it's an official show, right? So, and he is great he is a natural dude he makes you feel comfortable you talking to him 
and he also makes the audience feel like they're there. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. He is really can't wait to hear you two together. That's going to be great. That's going to be really good. Um, yeah, yeah. The extras feed has been, uh, we, we tried the show called the Friday stream because I still can't help myself. I still have to try these random ideas (laughs) and, uh, and it didn't work as of course Joe told me it wouldn't. Um, and so, but out of that, the thing that I, I like the most is extras from that rising like the Phoenix came extras dot show. And uh, we were able to just throw random interviews on there that maybe don't make it into a show. Or I have this thing that I call office hours with Chris, where if I get like a bunch of people asking about something, I'll read it all. I'll read it on there and just, you know, here's a, here's a thing I can link people to when they ask me about this now. Right. Um, that kind of stuff. That's a catch all for awesome stuff, dude. It really is. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Creative. Well, we just listed out all of the shows you're doing now, but there are a ton of shows that you've Jeez. put out that you've retired or yeah. archived. Um, how do you go about archiving or retiring these shows? Is it based on numbers? Is it based on you feel your feelings that it's outlasted itself? Or how do you go about retiring these shows? It's definitely all of the above. Um, you know, you get an idea of like how much feedback a show is getting by the email or comments or tweets or telegrams or discords or IRCs or et cetera, et cetera, right? Like you get as a host, you kind of learn what a, like a, what a, what a normal amount is and what a lot is and what none is. You get a sense of that. And that's true for each show. Um, we do look at data too, just so that way it's another uh, thing we can look at. And Angela is really super good with all of that. And then it's a bit of, well, now it's really, it would be a discussion. I guess I, I would have ultimate say if there was a show I was just like, we're done with. Um, but it would really kind of be a team discussion. And we'd probably these days take a look at how can we just improve it and not end it? Because we, the shows we have now all do really well. And so they have people that would be really upset if they just went away. And that's something uh, since the end of Voyager, I have carried with me that I try not to just end a show that people have really come to love because it's hard. Like with last, like I really wanted to give a long heads up on that one. Like we gave like a month's heads. Like I just, it's, it's a rough thing. So it's, it's numbers, it's the feel, it's the volume of engagement it gets with the audience. Um, and you know, you can even just kind of get an idea of like how popular is a show in the general community? Is it getting talked about at all? Is it getting downloaded? Is it getting recommended? Are the people you talk about recognizing it? Um, so those are, it's like a, it's like this complex bringing all of that in, looking at all of that and going, yeah, I think this is the right call. A lot of times it's a more clear answer. If we can take the resources from one thing that's not doing very well and put them towards something that's got a great shot um like self-hosted for example i think was right out of the gate it was like people got that yet the idea of that show immediately friday stream that's an example of when we don't quite execute right i think right so i just kind of looked at it and went yeah okay let's stop doing the friday stream it takes a lot of time a lot of resources we could put that energy into something a little bit better well i believe like your brand is important your name is important um where did you come up with the Jupiter Broadcasting name? And even more than that, how do you come up with the names for the shows? Because I think it's a pretty important dynamic Oof. to it's hard the show too, itself. Right? Super hard. I sometimes think it's like one of the hardest things when you're launching a show. It's like you, you got to figure out a title. Um, self-hosted was obvious. And it was, uh, I think it might have been Alex's idea. He really, he really was passionate about it from the very beginning. When we launched Jupiter Broadcasting, we also launched it with a series of non-Linux related podcasts called Radio Revolver, which was my show that I would take uh, old time radio series, like a, like a story arc, and try to take them into an audio editor, clean them up, tweak them a little bit better for driving audio, like bring up the mids and treble a little bit, take down the lows, take out some hiss, and then research it a little bit with a beginning and end and play the episode. So that was Radio Revolver which people still, I thought about releasing in the extra. So if people want that, they should let me know. Cause I've heard somebody else say, you should do an extra radio revolver. So I went and dug up all of the old assets, but then I never did anything with it. Cause you know, got other things to do. And then, and then Brian had a, um, a podcast that he called Mac Murphy PI that he did a limited run of that was sort of theater of the mind. It was a, it was a radio drama that he created. And so we were kind of going for this classic old time radio 
feel that we thought we'd kind of build like from that sort of geeky topics and nerdy stuff that people love. And so Jupiter Broadcasting was the name we went with. Now, looking back at it, I probably would go with something like Jupiter Signal or something because on Twitter, Jupiter Broadcasting takes up a lot, but I'm old Rocco and that was pre-Twitter when we launched. So <laughs> I think at least. Well, you, well, you say that you're old, but I'm older than you. So. <laughs> Are you? Are you though? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Maybe. I'll have to take your word for it. All right. Um, so in 2018, Jupiter Broadcasting announced that uh, Linux Academy had acquired Jupiter Broadcasting. So what were the, what was the, the events that led up to you deciding that, that this is the way we need to go? Well, that's another one. Um, so it was me kind of coming to the conclusion that I, I wanted to up my game in terms of uh, the accuracy and the content and, and the sound. And, and I was like, okay, I need, I need full-time staff. Um, and I had really kind of reached my personal threshold on the amount of advertising I was going to bring into the shows. So I either had to A, include more advertising, or B, up the rates, which would have started a cycle of me just having to sort of perpetually shop for sponsors. Um, and I wasn't really interested in spending a considerable amount of time maintaining a dozen different sponsor relationships. I was very, very thankful to have a set few sponsors and I, I it got repetitive, which was the downside, but the positive side was I almost 100% focused on content and I had these sponsors that were keeping the lights on and I could focus on content and I didn't want to change that up much and I didn't want to add more ads. And so I, I started talking originally with Anthony, the CEO of Linux Academy, when they were have, having issues with the live stream, I'm sitting here on YouTube and I'm watching a Linux Academy uh, live stream because these are my clients, right? And I want to stay current on what they're doing so I can keep the ad copy fresh with new insights on what the company's working on. So I'm sitting here watching the live stream and it's, it's a bit rough. They're having audio issues. And I notice like a Mac shows up in the screenshot. I'm like, oh no, this is not good. <laughs> So I email Anthony and I'm like, uh, Hey man, uh, you know, uh, you guys have just been a really great sponsor for like four years. Um, I'll fly down there and, uh, actually, so I think I'll drive down there. Cause again, love my RV. I'll drive down there and I'll do a whole OBS setup for you. Like we have here in the studio. Cause at this point I was pretty happy with our, with our Linux OBS setup. And Anthony's like, man, that is great. I'll pay for your trip down here. I will order hardware dedicated for it. Email these guys with what your specs are and what capture devices we should get. And I'll pay for your fuel. Come on down. I'm like, okay. Got me a little paid for road trip to Tejas. There you go. And uh, so the lady dog and I uh, load up in Lady Jupes and we head down for Texas Linux Fest. And uh, we get to a campsite. Of course, I don't have a car. So I just took taking my RV and it's just outside of Austin. And uh, so I text Anthony and he's like, yeah, I'll come pick you up. No big deal. And so we're driving and talking and, you know, we start, you know, maybe, maybe I should contract with you to, to help us with some of this stuff. And, you know, we start talking about how we could work like that. He says, you know, and we also could use some help. We're trying to launch some podcasts and we just, you know, we're not happy with the results and there's been a couple of initiatives and they haven't gone anywhere. I'm like, yeah, yeah, we could probably help with that. Um, and so that was the conversation over Texas Linux Fest. After Texas Linux Fest, uh, I packed up the RV and drove to their office. So they had a spot in their parking lot where I could just boondock for a week while I worked on his live stream. And, you know, parts were coming in for the computer. So I was assembling a computer and I would do my day job, which was JB. And then in the evening, after I was done recording, I'd go over and I'd work in the Linux Academy office and I'd assemble the OBS system and get it connected and get it tested. And a um, couple of late nights, I'd you know, I'd go over to Anthony's house for dinner and we'd be sitting there and chatting over nachos and we just started talking more. He's like, well, what if we just bought you guys? And, you know, we just take out the ads and we just hire the people you need. And then the community gets these podcasts with no ads. You guys get more staff and it's a great way for us to give something back to Linux users and podcasts are perfect for them because it's likely the people that are getting excited about the industry anyways, and a lot of them would be inclined to want to get training and further their education. So it's kind of an obvious tie-in with the Linux Academy platform. What do you think? And so I took that week and I thought about it. And the end of it, I thought, let's do it. You know, let's, let's do this. 
And um, I, I actually think uh, Joe was technically hired before I was, which is kind of a bit of irony. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they got, you know, because Joe made sure these things get, these things get done. And so, uh, and then, and then I think I was hired and, and Angelo was hired. And then we, we brought on West pretty quickly after that, after he, he had to wrap up a job he was at. Um, and then we just grew the team out uh, for, for a while. Uh, we just, you know, we added more people and uh, some on cam or some on mic, some off mic and, and got a, got a team going. And it really just kind of took everything to the next level. Like we started taking this stuff a little more seriously, uh, but also had more room to have fun at the same time and like work on bigger projects. And that was quite the thing. And right. Just a few weeks, like it was all time to the to really, you know, to a T, right? So we, we get everything done. We get all the paperwork signed. We make sure everybody's happy. Everything's finalized. And then we announce. So the Tuesday comes up that Linux unplugged. I'm going to announce on the show. And over the past three weeks leading up to that, I had been getting sicker and sicker and sicker to the point where it's getting really bad. And I th at first thought it was stress because I had been really stressed before. And managing a merger while trying not to let the public know about it yet, because that's how mergers work. Um, and then keeping all the shows going while in Texas and traveling back home and flying home to see the kids. I just thought I got myself some food poisoning and now it's not going away. And I, I just kept pressing on. And I got three weeks into what turned out to be um, a ruptured appendix. Oh, I no. didn't know my, yeah. And so I had, I had been living with a fever for a week. I hadn't been, I hadn't been able to kept food down for three weeks. And, um, I got to the hotel the weekend before the announcement. So this is like the Saturday before the announcement on Tuesday. And I couldn't get out of bed. My hip gave out on me because it turned out that when my appendix ruptured, a bunch of gross stuff came out inside my body and was chewing away at like the muscles to keep my stomach in place and chewed away at my hip muscles. So I kind of became paralyzed in that, in that leg. And I think, I think my, my fiance at the time, I don't think we were married yet. She had was coming down for a romantic getaway weekend in Texas and she showed up and I'm dying in the bed. <laughs> I mean, that's not nothing to laugh at, but <laughs> no, it was quite not what she was expecting. So she takes me to the ER. Um, and, uh, they're like, yeah, sure enough. You've, you're, you're not going anywhere. You've got a ruptured appendix. You're in here for at least seven days. And I said, no, 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 you don't understand. Um, uh, <laughs> On Tuesday, I've got I've got a really big announcement. I, I've got to be I back at work on Tuesday. Do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like you are not going anywhere, sir. You are going in for surgery immediately. And uh, they sure did. They brought me in and they cut me up because it was so damaged, it was so ruptured. They had to go in there and clean out and scrape out like a lot of gross stuff. And uh, so I was for seven days. I was just in the hospital bed recovering. On the eighth day, I got like a ticket home, and I flew home and. My, my great, wonderful wife spent the entire time on the hospital bed waiting for me to recover the entire time. Um, while we were in Texas, all of our friends and family were back up in Seattle and we were in a strange hospital we'd never been to while I was recovering. And um, when I finally recovered, like it took a while, then we made the announcement. Right. <laughs> Amazing story, man. Amazing. It was crazy. And uh, I did not have health insurance before the merger. And the health insurance had just kicked in by like a week or three before I ended up in the hospital. And so I was very grateful for that. The timing was unbelievable on that one. <laughs> nice. Well, looking through your podcasting career, um, what are some of the obstacles you encountered and what advice would you give to somebody if they wanted to follow that same career path of creating content? I look at um, a commitment to a podcast uh, to very closely to the same level of commitment as a romantic relationship. So, yeah, so think about how much commitment it takes to commit to a person. And a podcast isn't that far off if you're really serious about it, because you have to be thinking about that podcast whenever you're not recording that podcast. You have to work on that podcast when you're sick, when you don't feel good. When you're going through a divorce, you have to go through it. Like when things are happening in life, you know, someone's sick in your family or your kid's having a really bad day at school and there's some issues you've got to work out. You have to persevere through all of that because you don't want to disappoint your audience. And that's a good 
mental framework to think about, are you ready for that level of commitment to something? It's not necessarily that way for everybody. That's what it is for me. Every podcast I take, I, even now, 13 years doing this, I get a little bit of cold feet. Like before we launched self-hosted, I really had to ask myself, do I have the bandwidth to do this? Am I ready for another podcast relationship? Um, and I really had to think. And it turns out I was super ready for it. But um, yeah, so that, that I think is a framework to think about the level of commitment because if you're lucky, you're going to do hundreds of episodes of this thing. That's a lot of weeks. That's a lot of weeks, dude. Yeah. So I'm going to put you on the hot seat and ask you like a really unfair question. Okay. <laughs> um, Yay! <laughs> with all of the amount of time and episodes that you've put in, do you have a, not a favorite podcast, but maybe a favorite memory of something through the years? Hmm. Oh boy, yes. Every, basically every show, there's moments for sure. Um, I, I, I loved doing Last Live at Dell. That was, that was great. Um, I, I still laugh at some moments from Coda Radio. Uh, one of my absolute favorite and most awkward moments at the time, but now is one of my favorite, was my co-host Mike had a really hard time with Apple's announcement of the Swift development language. And so we watched the live stream and we like live commented. And then when it was done, we recorded the episode to get his take and he rage quitted about 15, 20 minutes into the show. He was so upset. And I was just left there with the live stream and a couple ad reads to do. <laughs> and I'm like, and I, I, I was so terrified at the time, but now I look back and I have a great laugh about it. And, you know, he and I have given each other a hard time about it over the years. So it's, it's good fun. Um, so there's moments like that. I, I genuinely love every episode of user air. It, you know, they do have, not safe for work language on there. So it's not our most like widely appealing show, but it is three guys that are just discussing life, the universe and Linux in a very genuine, um, actually kind of vulnerable way. And I listen the moment that episode hits my podcast feed, I, I hit play on that. And I, I mean, every episode there's moments that I, I think are just hilarious. So with all of this content you've made, what are the future goals for JB? Well, um, I'm really trying to do more original content. I really want to do more. Um, like we go out, we contact the people, we talk to them, we develop a story around that, and then we cover it on the air. Um, because again, there's just so much, so much good stuff. Like we, last week I was talking about how I was really proud of that Linux Unplugged where we talked about Nebula and Tink, which is so funny, right? Because Tink has been around since the 90s and Nebula came out two weeks ago. And so it's such an interesting contrast and they both do really incredible things networking wise and nobody's really writing about that anymore and so right. we have an opportunity to say well here's here's what's interesting about this still um not all developers have been super receptive but i have been really happy to say that a lot of these developers are really passionate about what they're doing so when i email them and i say hey i'm trying to get my coverage as accurate as possible can you help me understand this or that like they are enthusiastic about responding um, from like recently with the WireGuard developer, he, he like responds immediately to the questions because he knows like sometimes we have a tight window and just small little details that we can get right on air. I want to do more of that. Um, so there's that. Also, I haven't figured out the right way and I don't want to jar the audience, but there's like over 60 full-time training architects at Linux Academy and they really are from the industry like that linux academy hires them to do the educational material after they have experience and they've done this stuff so we currently can use them as email resources to be like you know hey mike how does this work on aws i don't i don't know what these terms mean these are crazy aws marketing terms what does this actually mean and you can write back a really clear to understand easy to kind of digest explanation but all of these individuals have like full audio setups and video setups so I may try to launch a show in the future that like does mini series with some of these people that a couple of these people I've become friends with and they're really funny and they have really good on air voices that like should be on microphone. You like, and you know, you hear somebody you're like your voice is so good. You should be on mic. Yep. A couple of those. So I'd love to explore that more things that are just sort of original 
um, that help people, that give back to the community in some way. It's a big focus of ours. Well, even just doing these Linux Spotlight shows where you said those you have all of those great people in one place, um, just doing the Linux Spotlight shows, you get to meet and talk with people that are just awesome people. And you don't you wouldn't get that if you didn't sit down with them for a little bit and talk to them. So I I would be interested in that. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, brunch with Brent has been really has been really great because I totally have gotten that from that experience um, and your show. And I think the great part about open source is it's made up of people, and there is a lot of interesting characters out there. And some of them are very similar to our stories, and some of them are. are, are remarkably different and completely different countries. And it's a, it's a pretty wide base. And um, a lot of them are very enthusiastic, prideful. I, I think you could say they have a lot of pride for better, or for worse than what they do. And so if you contact them and say, Hey, I want to get this right. They respond pretty well to that. But if you get it wrong and you didn't contact them ahead of time, they really, they really get angry. <laughs> <laughs> do not ask for forgiveness in this case. It's right. ask, ask to get it right. And, yeah. Definitely some uh, community feedback comes your way. <laughs> a lot, yeah. It's a thing, isn't it? It's, and it's really all over the place now with uh, Discord and Telegram and IRC and YouTube comments and Twitter is a big one. I always mention it last, but it's like one of the main ones. Yeah. Um, kind of all over the place. Well, let's go back to Linux for a little bit. Um, is there any software that you think uh, would change the landscape that you would like to see come to Linux. Now, I know there's no like magical piece of software, one that would do that, but is there something that you think would be the biggest? I want to answer something that's not like the go-to, you know? Everybody always says like, oh, the Adobe suites and right. stuff. Um, but I don't know, you know, um, Blender's getting pretty good. You also have uh, Blackmagic makes DaVinci Resolve. Is what I use. Um, on the audio side, I don't know if you've ever checked out Reaper. Wow. Reaper is a next level professional audio tool. It's what we use now. It's, it's a commercial product, but it's like 80 bucks. And it is a next level audio workstation. And they even make an image for the Raspberry Pi, which is mind blowing. And so I don't even want like some of those tools, maybe Photoshop, but I'm not so positive about any of that, really. I think it's all kind of going somewhere where you can either stream an application or you can run a web application or you can virtualize it. So I think really what we need is more refinement. Um, you know, like I mentioned, I like distro hopping because every desktop's great and there's different implementations. The other implicit side of that statement is, is not every desktop's great. Like not every implementation of a particular environment is great. And there could perhaps be uh, more refinement around there. I, I like to think of Linux's future user base as a lot of technical users. We'll often talk about the new Linux user as this sort of concept of got to make everything really easy. We need everything to be click, click, click. But I actually think if we're honest with ourselves, future users are going to be developers, system administrators, and power users, people that want more than what Windows can provide. Or, you know, think something like that. Like they come from the Mac and they want more than what Mac OS can provide. Well, that is a hot topic right now of, you know, whether you want a new user to even come. There are some people that don't want new users to come to Linux. They don't want Linux to get popular. Well, that's, I mean, can't we have all? It's a big <laughs> umbrella. Can we all fit? Right. But, uh, <laughs> well, so are you this, I mean, you just mentioned a couple programs um, that are proprietary. Uh, mm. Are you an open source enthusiast? Oh, for sure. Yeah. I, I have a, I have like an order. It's if it's free and open source first, I always go that route. I will work down the stack to eventually it just has to be runnable on Linux. I will eventually go as far as that compromise. Um, but much prefer it to be free and open. In fact, I, even in the last year, I've, I've, I've taken a big hard turn towards self-hosting, not so much because I'm concerned about privacy in the cloud, because most of what I work on is all public anyways, I just want predictability. Right. Um, I just want to know it's going to be available and it's not going to change. They're not going to take features away. So from a self-control and privacy standpoint, but that's secondary, I, I tend to always go open source first, especially, especially on infrastructure. Right. So I started using Linux for reasons like, you know, 
customizing it and it was flexible. Yeah. And that was what I started years ago with. But uh -huh. coming into all of the communities, it wasn't always great. I think the best reason to run Linux is the community, is the people that you interact with. But what drives your passion for Linux? I think I have used it for so long now that I would, I would be tying a hand or two behind my back if I switched to anything else. So there's that. Um, I really come, have come to rely on just the fundamental goodies you get with Linux. SSH is so great. I know I can get it now on Mac OS and stuff, but I just expect all these things to be in certain places. So there's a certain amount of momentum behind it now. I also find other desktop operating systems generally pretty frustrating because I'm used to the customization and features of a Linux desktop. Like mounting an, an SFTP share should be super easy on other operating systems, and it's not. Um, so there's those elements to it. But you're right about the community aspect. And where I feel it the most is we have a virtual lug on Linux Unplugged where people of all different backgrounds come and we just talk about stuff in the pre-show and the post-show and in the show itself. And I can still appreciate the ability to co communicate with another human being about these things because there was a time when no one else in the room knew what I was talking about when I was talking about <laughs> Red Hat. What are you talking about Red Hat? Debian, what's Debian? You know what I mean? Like there right. was a time. Yeah. So like I still really get a lot out of that. And that's a whole nother level when you go to like a, like a Linux fest or a scale or a self, like it's a whole nother, whole nother level where you're actually in real, in real meat space talking this stuff. Um, and one of the things that I really benefited from is when we brought on a full-time team, it was a full-time team of Linux users. So we all kind of upped each other's game. Um, and we got, we got really kind of, uh, next level about all this stuff about if one guy couldn't solve something, well, there's a group of us that can troubleshoot this and get it working. And then once we get it working, we, ha we now have like a, a group culture on how, how we do this on this, on these desktops. And like that has really come next level because it's, it's meant that I didn't have to pioneer at all. I didn't like how I didn't, it wasn't solely up to me to figure out how to get Jack audio working to rely on both Wes and Drew who are like next level wizards with jack audio <laughs> and so then they got it all really really cool dialed in with our mixer like every individual channel on our mixer feeds into jack audio when we route audio between multiple applications with jack it's great and i now benefit from them learning it really deep and i've just learned what i need to like troubleshoot and implement it and use it to record but they understand like deeply how it works and so that's been really great because when I was doing it all myself, I just did not have time to deep dive like that. Yep. Well, I'm not into Jack. It's a little over it's my much, head. It's a bit much. Yeah, it's, it's a little a over much. my head, but <laughs> I can appreciate the people that are. So. Yeah, it's really something, um, you know, because I think Linux gets a bad rap for uh, being not a great media production operating system. Um, but there's no doubt about it. We've crossed a threshold where we could never go back because we use stuff that only Linux does. Um, like Jack audio over the network is great. And also GStreamer, which people don't talk about as much, is also fantastic. Um, at, at we've toyed with like re releasing open source recording bundles or something that all run in one Docker container, like a Jack in the box. Everything's all plumbed. You just open up Chrome or you open up Firefox or you open up Mumble and you just select the audio interfaces that would be bridged to pulse from this container and it does all of the routing it does all of the voip stuff it does all of that all that jack magic for you in this container and just sends the audio out oh wow yeah we've played with it but then every time we kind of get it built west like has a brand new idea that makes it even better and so then we restart <laughs> but <laughs> that happens. it'll get there <laughs> eventually yeah yeah it's all nice it's all good it's a lot of fun to mess with it and it's just it's great to to geek out with your fellow work buddies plus the wider community about this stuff. Um, and that really does drive me. It really does get me like just so super excited about it that like, I, I still have to talk about it even all this time. I still have to get it out. I got to get it out. <laughs> it's true. Well, you've been around Linux for a long time, dude. Um, you know that there was a time when the community wasn't so friendly to mm. new users, mm -hmm. uh, to a lot of people really. Um, what has your experience been as a whole since being in Linux um, with the community, good or bad? 
I think a majority has been pretty positive. I think worst case, other than people just coming at me for like stuff from the shows or something, which I kind of aside, right. um, like I've had a couple of times where I kind of stumbled into an IRC room and just interjected a question and didn't really maybe like sit back and observe the culture for a minute and then interject. And so I got stomped on once or twice. So I've had those moments that can kind of hurt. But I, I mean, that feels like I can maybe recall two out of thousands of interactions. Um, and you've always got a couple of uh, rotten eggs in a group. But I, I have really found that if you connect on a passion to passion level, it's generally, it's always been a pretty positive experience. I mean, I, I really sh probably should not even say this out loud. I don't have any wood nearby, but um, I mean, we open up a mumble room yes. on our Linux podcast. And that first 300 plus episodes has gone swimmingly well. It's crazy, right? Um, uh, and, uh, you know, like Big Daddy Live, you have how many people will join a session, right? And it, it goes well. Like people are polite and want to participate and share. Yep. Uh, well, it's it's come a long way, dude. We've gotten so much better over the years that uh, yes. we yeah. have. I, I think there are more collective of good people in there now that it's just drowning out the the rotten eggs. So you can have a situation where your mumble room or the Biddle group where we just do this live show and anybody basically can join. Like we have a waiting room and, uh, you know, somebody comes in. We don't know everybody's name that comes in. Mm -hmm. And 99% of the time we let whoever's there in and yeah, it's been a great experience. I think it, I've also found that when I've traveled and I've done like little mini meetups that are one or two, three people at a time, all the way up to the large groups, um, never really had any particularly nasty experiences. There's, there's sometimes characters that maybe cross a line or two, but it's such a, it's such a small amount. And I think what happens is the peak of the discourse is what we see. We see, we see the, the most outrage or we see the, the most hype. Um, but you look at the developers themselves, uh, like the most recent Libre application summit, it's cats and dogs getting along just fine. Everybody's helping each other. It's collaborative. It's Fedora talking to an Ubuntu dev, a Plasma dev that's working with a GNOME shell developer. Uh, they don't, they don't have that rivalry that we kind of go on about, um, or some do. Uh, it's all friends. It's all people working just to solve problems. And I think that's the reality. That's the vast, vast majority. But like I was saying, the peaks of these conversations that sort of the stick out of the, the, the tip of the iceberg is what we can see. Because that's what's on Reddit. That's what's on YouTube. That's what's on Twitter. And those are public mediums. And the other real getting work done practical conversations are private messaging systems or email and things like that. Yeah. This, the developers getting together, I think we have more issues in rivalry <laughs> in the community yeah. as far as distros and desktop environments than they do themselves. <laughs> it's weird, dude. Yeah. I mean, it's, some, it's funny too how there's some that you can see are some of those, like they do start with the project and then it kind of extends into the community. And then some of them like it just comes out of nowhere. Human nature, it's, it's on, a, on a grand scale and it's out in front of everybody. It's an interesting experiment. So do you yourself do any coding or scripting? Mm, not, I mean, do you count Bash? Uh, we, have some, we have some pretty cool Bash scripts. Uh, but no, no, I, uh, I've really always been more on the system administration, standard up, configuration side. And I've always found development to be very tedious, like very, very tedious. What about yourself? Do you ever dabble? No, it's just, I, I don't <laughs> have the time to, you know, yeah, there's that full, too, right? Full-time job, a podcast, a live mm -hmm. show. It's just, there's mm -hmm. not enough time, dude. There yeah. just isn't. I, I've thought about it, you know, uh, especially something like um, Python has crossed my mind quite a few times. So maybe one day, like, I, I feel like that could be a thing I do. If I ever become that hobbit somewhere. <laughs> Take a Python book with me. I don't know what I'd do with it. But. Take the RV and the Python book. Yeah, totally. That's the thing. Like I have a whole project in that RV so I can be, I can kind of be quasi online when I'm offline. I call it project off grid and I'm having, I'm going to have cached documents. I have cached videos and music and audio books. 
so I can go live in the forest somewhere for a couple of weeks. It's a dream. Right. Well, there's a lot of people that want to contribute to Linux. And, you know, it's a myth that you have to be a developer to contribute because everybody contributes in their own way. You yourself contributed. How many hours, dude, do you think you have put into over the years into your stuff and it's all for the community in Linux? It uh, definitely could be measured in years. That's for sure. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I don't know if I want to know. Rocco. <laughs> <laughs> but what would you say to somebody who wants to contribute to Linux but doesn't know how or where? Mm. This is something I've been thinking about recently. Um, you know, there's a couple of things that have made me think about this. So some projects have been switching over to GitHub to make it easier for people to contribute, and uh, Kali Linux, the penetration testing distribution, just put out a brand new release. It's a really cool release. But one of the things they've done with this release is they switched all of their documentation to Markdown and they've put that up on GitHub. So you can go do a pull request or an issue or a merge request for their documentation and they've intentionally switched it to Markdown to make it a little bit more approachable by just about anybody. So that's a good one is, is stuff like that. I, I have been trying to think if there's a way I could talk about like the process of reporting a bug and talk about it from a couple of different distribution standpoint and when to know if it's an upstream issue or if it's a distro specific issue. Um, and maybe even trying to come up with sort of a, like this is an area I've thought about with the YouTube channel would be like how to file bugs kind of stuff. I don't know if it'd be very effective though. Um, I have a sense people know that it's an option. I think it would be very effective. Uh, Popey did- so? Popey did a video on reporting a bug and how to do it. And it's something that doesn't get the exposure it needs because there are a lot of people that want to report bugs, but don't know how. And there, you know, obviously there are people who don't want to report bugs at all, but there's no resource unless you want to go digging for yeah. how many countless hours on how to do it. So he did a video on it. I think you should, I think that would be a great. Yeah, I, I'm going to think more about it. You know, I was, Really, what kind of got my my wheels rolling on this was I was listening to Choose Linux on the way in, and Elle was talking about how she's taking a 100-day coding challenge, and an open-source developer saw that she was doing that on Twitter and reached out to her and said, I've got some low-hanging bugs that if you wanted to just try to go after as part of this 100-day coding challenge, this could be a great way to go. And I really liked that idea, and it got me thinking, what if I did something like that with the audience? like a two week bug triaging challenge where the audience and I, we have some sort of way to like track it. I don't know how that would be. Obviously this is not a very fleshed out idea, but I thought about something where like, what if I was able to use some of the reach of the show to get people to go on a marathon of, of doing this? I don't know the right way to approach it. I don't want to inundate projects with a bunch of crap bug reports, right. but I thought that could be a way to affect real change. And I, Wes and I do it along with the audience. And, and then we talk about the experience of did our bug get rejected or, you know, what, what happened. And um, I just really kind of was coming up with that today as I was, I was listening to Elle and I really liked the idea of taking that 100-day coding challenge and using it to help projects. That's, that's clever. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow her journey on that one with some interest. Yep. It's a good way to give back. Yeah. So do you believe Linux is bad at marketing? I don't know if I, I kind of want to argue with the premise just a little bit if I could, um, because I don't think you would want to market Linux so much. I think you'd want to market elementary OS. I think you'd want to, you'd want to market a solution um, to a problem. Uh, Linux itself, like even Linus will, will tell you that it's just an implementation detail. Like he understands and has no problem with the fact that most people using Android have no idea there's any Linux involved. He's totally at peace because that's what he built Linux for. It's an implementation detail. Now, I love and appreciate the fact that it's Linux. You do. Like, it's a big deal to us. Right. But if you want to get the next wave of users, you got to be solving problems. And I think distributions like Ubuntu proper, Pop! OS, and Elementary OS for your, your more average, newer users, and then your, Man, your Manjaro for your more advanced users all have really solid offerings. So my focus would be like 
elementary OS on a Dell XPS and market a whole product around that. Um, that's how I'd approach it. So do you think we need that, that one distro, like say elementary OS to market to the masses? I think there would be, I think there would be advantages to having consensus on the distro we suggest to people um, when they're new. Like I was just listening to a podcast who doesn't cover this stuff. This isn't their area, but they just brought it up and they were trying out mint recently. Like, so mm -hmm. mint's another one you'll hear. And then, then after that, they went and found ultimate mint, which is like a respin that's older than main mint. And like, I don't know if I'd recommend that, but you know, they go down this and there's not just like a, if you type into Google, the best distro for a first time user, like there's not a consensus and there would be benefits to it. However, having just talked about how I enjoy distro hopping, I see each of the major distributions solving a different problem set and maybe having a different customer base especially when you look at what people run on the enterprise and what they're developing applications for, um, that can often dictate what desktop environment they're working in. And that's, that has nothing to do with how easy it is. Right. Um, and so you can't just say one distro. The market has spoken. There's people that need Scent. There's people that need Ubuntu. There's people that need OpenSUSE. Right. So I don't think you can have just one distro. And I think you would lose some of the advantages of sort of the organic, almost evolutionary nature of, trying a hundred things and over time we figure out which of the two or three of those hundred things works. Um, we're still doing that with system D. I think you need that to have something that's more than just a product with features that go on a box, something that lasts 25, 35, 50 years kind of has to have some natural evolution to it, to stick around, to, to be the fittest, to, to be the strongest. Um, so we'll never get there, but wouldn't it be great if we could all just like, just agree like, hey, we're all just going to plug elementary OS for like 2019, for 2019 or for 2020, like whatever, whatever year we pick, like for this year, we'll all just answer, answer elementary OS. And then for the next year, we'll pick another distro. You know, like that would be wonderful. And I think would be a lot more effective because it'd be so much e easier to answer questions, uh, to tell you what kind of hardware it's going to work on, to solve problems. It would be a lot more straightforward, but it's just not the nature of the beast, I don't think. I don't think um, we could agree on that one distro as no. a community. We just no, couldn't. No, it would never happen. It would <laughs> never happen for sure. So that's how you know it couldn't happen. Um, and I don't know, like, I, I, I think I will be alive. And I, I think I'll live a while when Windows is no longer a consumer product. You know, maybe it'll be some new product that virtualizes Windows when you need application compatibility. But it won't be Windows based on the NT kernel as we know it. Um, and I think Linux will still be going strong by then. I made a prediction last year that this year uh, Microsoft would put out a Windows version based on the Linux kernel. <laughs> oh my gosh, wouldn't that, wouldn't that be like an earthquake that would just rock the industry? And what would you do? And especially like if it was genuinely like an open product, right? Let's just fantasize for that moment. Let's say Microsoft released gpl Cody, right? Like they went all in. <laughs> what a conundrum we would all face. Like, what do we do? Um, you know, and also, you know, there'd be immediate respins of like pr free, all privacy tracking removed versions like there are of Chromium. Same thing yeah. would happen. I still got a few weeks left for that prediction. <laughs> it probably yeah. won't happen, but I got a few weeks. I mean, <laughs> things have changed so much with Microsoft, going back to how passionately I, I hated them. Things have changed so much that uh, now doesn't seem crazy. Like it doesn't seem super likely, but I might do a double take if I saw the headline, but then I'd be like, oh, well, they did it. They actually did it, you know, and it would just now be the new normal. I, that's where we're at with Microsoft now. Right. It's weird. Well, you hear this thrown around everywhere. What do you think of when I say the year of the Linux desktop? <laughs> Man, it's been the year of the Linux desktop for me for a very long time. <laughs> That's kind of what I go back to is I feel like it's the year of the Linux desktop for different categories of users. Like a couple of years ago, like when Dell really started getting good at the Sputnik developer editions, we really started becoming a solid platform for developers that are creating web applications and uh, containerized applications and, and managing large scale systems, which happens to be a lot of people. Like we're a great freaking workstation for that. And we're a great workstation for a, for a recovering system ad administrator like myself, who's now doing audio production. Like it's the best for that. So I think for some of us, it, it is, 
it is a better choice than the, than the commercial platforms. It's just not there for, um, for like the ones that we see a lot of, like gaming, possibly. Although, I mean, I don't game a lot, but I am plenty satisfied with gaming on Linux these days. I have zero complaints. Very happy. So I think over time, things change. Maybe things get webified or we get things like Proton. And as Linux grows, we kind of expand the categories of users that we can accommodate over time. And I think it's just been a slow march towards that. Well, you mentioned the gaming area and I did a live stream the other day for a test for uh, Google Stadia. Yeah. So yeah. what are your thoughts on Stadia itself? Oh, these are complicated things, Rocco. <laughs> these you know? are complicated issues, dude. Because there's like all the privacy things about it. So I got to put like all that aside because it's Google. So there's like a mandatory dependency. Like if this conversation was a package, install mandatory privacy conversation dependency package. And then proceed forward with the rest of the conversation. And I would say Stadia for me right now, and this may change, is about outsourcing the compromise. My compromise is I don't want to invest in a GPU on a regular basis. And I'd really rather not deal with proprietary binary NVIDIA drivers and stuff like that. So I can outsource that problem to Google now if I have an adequate streaming system. That's my hope and my philosophy is that it sort of enables a more casual style of gaming for me um, that I can kind of just turn on and turn off like you can Netflix. So that I kind of, that appeals to me. However, I don't like the idea of these games living on Stadia. And I don't like the idea of an internet connection being mandatory, especially a solid one, because I don't always have one. So I'm very, very conflicted. I have enjoyed it so far and been impressed with how um, good the tracking is. Yep. But the video guy in me, he's still, he's still alive and well. And I look at the video encoding in high motion scenes and I go, man, I, I'm on a hundred megabit connection. And that looks like crap. <laughs> it just doesn't look good enough. It's too, it's too soft. It's too blocky. Um, they can do a better job. They better do a better job. Um, but it's early days. So I figure saves me from shelling on GPUs. Saves me from having to like go cheap and turn down all of my settings in the game. And it's worth a try because it's an interesting technology concept, especially when I can start linking to the game and stuff like that and game points. I, I could see it. I could see it. I don't know if they're going to get it though, Rocco. I, it's off to a rocky start. I don't know, dude. Um, you know, Ohm Live tried this same thing a couple yep. years ago and they failed. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I've always said that if anybody can accomplish this, Google can, uh, just because that's what they do. I think that there are some very valid uh, concerns, like not owning the game on your system and, and things you mentioned. But there are so many upsides to this that are unbelievable from, like you said, not needing a GPU. Mm -hmm. um, I free drivers. In, free drivers. You, it doesn't matter what operating system you're on. Think about how many times you've heard somebody say, I can't switch to Linux or I can't switch to Linux full time because of gaming. If they do this the right way and get all of the games that are out there. And it becomes known. People know that it's a thing that they can do. Yep. You can go from hitting buy on your app to hitting play on your browser in five seconds. And there will be a mentality shift there because you'll no longer have to ask yourself, will my game play on Linux? Well, it's on Stadia. So yeah, of course it's going to play on Linux. So guess what? It's easier to switch to Linux now. Yep. Yeah, and not to mention that Google requires the games be written for Linux and use Vulkan, which is great for those of us who do want to have the games locally installed too, whereas the Xbox project does not do that. Well, this is in early stages, so it's not perfect, but I can't wait to see how, how it plays out. I think it's going to be awesome myself. So kind of like a side prediction here on, on the show. Um, how long do you give it? Do you think it's a two-year project, a five-year project, a forever project? What do you think? You mean before they kill it? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it's going to be harder to kill. I hope so. It's, because it's not just uh, Google Plus or, you know, Google Inbox. It's not just a small service. This is a lot of uh, companies and relationships with companies. True. Um, it's, it's a 
you know, when you put marketing out there on boxes and it's not just a simple service to kill because we, and they're high dollar it. items, you know, hundred dollars for the red dead redemption bundle. Yep. So I think that it has a better chance of survival, but there's always that part in you that thinks maybe they will kill it at some point, but I think it's worth trying. It does. And it seems like the tie in on YouTube specifically when it comes to game streaming, they could stream directly from stadia. So it could be super high resolution to be able to link to the same game in, in the video description so people can click a single link and now they're playing that game. Yep. That seems really appealing. Like they could really bring it to Twitch with, with Stadia. If you can go from, you know, clicking pause on the computer, then go to your couch and play on the TV and just hit unpause. Like these things are just unbelievable. Yeah. It's strange though for a Google product in that dependent on the mobile app. You have to like buy the games on the mobile app. You have to set it up on the mobile app. You configure the controller with the mobile app. That is weird. Yeah. It, normally their stuff has a web component and a pretty decent one at that. Um, it's a new Google in a way. I think yeah. one of their new messaging apps is like that too. Everybody's changing. Microsoft is changing. Google's changing. <laughs> well, Google's becoming the new Microsoft and I don't know what Microsoft's becoming. The new IBM? I'm not sure actually. <laughs> Uh, Chris, if you could change one thing about Linux, what would it be? Hmm. I would really love to have one package manager. You know, one of the things I've really enjoyed being back on Arch is one package manager. It doesn't matter if I want something from the AUR. Like, I'm not dealing with any kind of packaging formats. It doesn't matter what the app is. It's in the AUR, and it's the same command to update and install all of them. And I really appreciated that. I kind of, I guess I kind of got fatigued in both Ubuntu and Fedora, how I've been hunting for a snap or a flat pack and comparing which one I want, or if I want to do the repo and is this installing from the snap store or is this installing from the repository? Is this from Flathub or is this from the Fedora modular repo? Like I didn't realize I was doing a bit of math that I was kind of getting exhausted by. And so just having Pac-Man, it's been really nice. It's really been nice. So I'd love, I know that's crazy and obviously never going to happen as the universal packaging format war has showed us, but, um, geez, that would be my, that would be my thing. One package manager. And I know there's some projects out there. I know there's some that exist, but I mean like genuinely every distro just ships with it installed by default. Right. Well, that is like the, that is the strongest thing about Linux and the Achilles yeah. heel to Linux. It's all, you know, that, I don't think that'll ever go away. And I don't know if it should, you know, um, because I love apt. Like I said earlier, is one of the things that really made it click for me. But these days, I also think DNF is great and Pac-Man is great. And they, I, I would be sad if I were to lose apt or lose DNF. I wouldn't be a net gain. Uh, I don't know what to do about it. But I, I have really enjoyed just, if I know the package name, I don't even have to look up like, what, how, how do they distribute it? I just type it in the command line and I've got it seconds later. And then right. it's getting updated. So thinking back on all of the reasons you chose to run Linux, do they still apply today? Hmm. I think a lot of the core ones do. Uh, visibility and control over my system, customization, a really great set of user land tools like the, you know, the GNU tools and all of the terminal stuff. Um, and then every really cool open source project that's come along in the last decade that I've wanted to try, especially hands down the server side stuff, has all been Linux first. Um, and so there's so much work I would, I would have to do. Yeah, I, I couldn't. Yeah, definitely. I, now that I think about it, a lot of the, like back then I was solving different problems, but it was really the fact that Linux let me solve those problems. Right. Now they're just new sets of problems that still Linux is really solving. And I freaking love that. I, and, I'll, and I've said this a couple of times too, but like getting insights into where projects are going or what features are coming down the Linux kernel as somebody who is building a production studio around this stuff, I find that really useful. Like I, I can plan and I can make long-term decisions about what software we use because of that, where I would be endlessly anxious with every Mac OS release because they always change something, something breaks, and you have a pretty tight time period in which you have to upgrade, it, it's, it's anxiety-inducing. I, I want my tools to be predictable, stable, and transparent. You just can't beat that. How are you going to beat that with free software? You can't beat that. Yeah. 
Can't beat it. Mm -mm. So is there anything else you'd like to share with people? No, I don't think so. Just go check out jupiterbroadcasting.com. Um, give a listen to the shows if you haven't already. Let us know your thoughts. We've got the Telegram group, jupiterbroadcasting.com slash Telegram. Love to have people in there too. Very nice. Is that, I mean, what is the best way to get a hold of you? if they Probably need to, that. Need to do? I mean, Telegram and Twitter are like my everyday check multiple times a day communication platforms. And then I batch email. So I, I do get email chris at jupiterbroadcasting.com, but I batch it a couple times a week because of the volume. It's right. just a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot, dude. It's well, a lot. <laughs> I'd like to take a moment to thank you, Chris, for... Now, we mentioned earlier about how many hours, if we added up, how many hours it would be that you put into everything that you have done. And that is all for the community. Every thank hour you. that you spent over the years, putting, giving back to the com community, because there's a lot of people that got their, that were drawn into Linux because of shows like the Linux Action Show. That's where they, that was their gateway into Linux. And going forward, so many shows and so many hours of content, I just want to thank you for everything that you've done for the community itself. Well, thank you. That's embarrassing, but thank you, Rocco. And uh, as I wanted to just say, now that we're thanking each other, uh, I can tell when somebody is a hard worker, even from afar, and I can definitely tell that you've put a ton of effort into the show, and I think it's a great thing. I think it really is good for the community, and so thank you, too. Awesome. Well, that's going to wrap up our discussion. Thank you for joining me, Chris. Thank you, sir. It's been fun. Thank you all for joining us this week as we spotlight the best thing about Linux, our community. Until next time, long live Linux. Test recording. Say something. Hello, Rocco. Check one, two, two. This is Chris coming from Seattle in my office just above the studio, above the JP1 studio. I'm trying to fix my camera, but it's like really stiff. Are you seeing this resistance I'm getting here? Like, I'm what seeing is this? the resistance. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost when you when you talk to Linux users sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I know that's true. Yeah, it won't bend. <laughs> right. So yours will be on the 18th. Just that water on. It's a good thing I didn't happen during the show. I just splashed myself. <laughs>